Okay, you guys, this is Professor Vitt. You're almost done. This is your last video. It's on advertising and critical thinking, financial decisions. I'll go as quick as possible. So I'll try to keep my chatter down to a minimum so you can be done with this thing and go back to your life. Ooh, ooh whoa, okay, massive pull out there. Okay, and we're okay, we're okay. All right, so uh, the video is just basically broken down into six short parts. Um, it seems like a lot, but it's not. We talk about why the United States adopts the approach to commerce that it has, why critical thinking applies at all to something like this, and then uh, the left-hand digit bias, uh, self or social esteem exploitation, the part-whole relation, and Shepard Ferry. So, um, look, um, three, four, and five are all examples of how um, with the use of critical thinking tools, you can make better decisions as a consumer. So let's start off with with number one: the, why the U.S. is a uh, why the U.S. is a consumer state. Now, I am not here to trash capitalism or force students to adopt negative views about capitalism or the United States. I love the U.S. I live here. I buy things. It's great. This is just a way of showing you how sometimes people um, are very good at manipulating you in order to get you in order to get your money, basically, really. So you don't have to say I love capitalism or I hate it. Um, we're just going to look at the material, right, as it relates to financial decisions for critical thinking. Okay, first one is just a general point: the United States is a commercial state. Now that. This only makes sense, just in brief passing, um, to contrast the idea of commerce with, with the medieval notion of commerce. So, what does that mean? It means people didn't always think it was such a great idea to go and buy things. People didn't always think it was such a great idea to go and sell them. Uh, there's a great quote from, from um, Augustine here. St. Augustine says, business is in itself evil so this is a medieval notion right hundreds of years ago saint augustine is dead now but his idea that business and commerce were somehow awful and the idea that you would actually take something change it and then sell it to somebody else for a greater profit was almost like it was almost immoral it was a sin you know why would you do that to someone but a guy named john locke comes along and john locke writes a book you're not tested on this uh, two tre uh, second treaties of government where he develops the notion of commerce that we're comfortable with today and that's basically the idea that it's okay for people to make money right that that's all right there's nothing wrong with it and part of the function of government is that it it helps out with that kind of thing okay um why does any of this apply well <clears throat> critical thinking applies to decisions that we make of any kind and financial decisions are just one aspect of that right and um, when you look at something like advertising uh, you have to understand that some of the smartest people on the planet are paid to come up with effective advertising campaigns and and it works i mean there's a reason why people pay for advertising right it, it works now, in addition to advertising, there are certain errors that your brain makes. Let's just stop and look at the left-hand digit bias error that your brain makes. Um, this is this thing, like you see it when, when you're looking at the TV and they say, hey, you can buy this new Floby hair cutter. It's only $19.99, right? And you say, well, it's not even 20 bucks because the one is like a one and that's not right. So, um, it, it's when that leftmost digit of a figure, you put too much emphasis on that, and that is how you assess the cost of something, right? So somebody says it's 1995, right? It's it's not even 20 bucks. Well, it's only a nickel different, but for some reason your brain, when it sees that one, it just assesses it differently. It just seems right? Isn't there a little bit of a difference between something costing $19.95 and something costing $24? It seems like the 19 figure is somehow more contained, right? Because you could pay for it with a, with a 20 maybe. I don't know. Um, but it's a tendency that your brain makes, right? It's a shortcut that it takes. Um, great example of this was from 1959 with the California State Water Project. Now, I think the initial estimates were something like it was going to cost upwards of ten billion dollars but they told voters uh, no it, it's cool it will only cost 1.75 billion right and there's even an interview 
in uh, in a book, Cadillac Desert, which is a great book if you're interested in water rights, um, where Governor Brown actually, it's not our governor right now, it's his dad, uh, where Governor Brown says, oh yeah, we actually decided that, uh, you know, 1.75 sounded better than 2 something or 3 something, right? It's kind of like giving him a little discount, right? And it, and it worked. Uh, the water project passed and voters uh, put it in and as a result we have a more robust infrastructure with regard to water now. Um, okay, another tactic that, that people will take either in advertising or in sales is to appeal to your need for self and social esteem. So um, if you're somewhere, right, like um, suppose we're at Costco and this guy's trying to sell us a cleaner um, and he says, gosh, you, you know, look at how this cleaner takes off all of these stains. Uh, is this something that you would find useful? Um, and if you then say, yes, that's something I would find useful, then, then it looks like you're a fool for not buying it. Well, if it's a useful product, buy it, right? It's a subtle point, but, but it's one that's real, that, that, that and people who've been in sales could tell you many more tactics than the one I'm pointing out now, but it, it's helpful, right? It helps to close the deal. Um, another example of this is this last barrier to purchase, right? People say, so if it wasn't for this one thing, would you buy the product, right? Okay, if it wasn't for the price, would you buy the product? And people say, yeah, I just think that it's, you know, you know, $50 is too much for a peanut. Uh, and somebody says, okay, well, what if I could tell you that you don't need to pay the 50 bucks for that all at once? You break it into installment plans, $5 for 10 months and you could have the peanut today. Well, right, it's, it's, um, it's a technique in sales. They, they ask you for what's this one thing that you, right, if it wasn't for this, you would buy it and then they remove that barrier and then you're off to the races, right? Um, now you may say, oh gosh, this social self-esteem stuff, it doesn't really work. Um, actually, just think about it for a second. Remember how difficult the example was involving the cards versus the um, versus the beer drinking, right? The reason that the beer drinking example was so much easier is because you have so many people. Um, well, let's put it this way: the reason why the example works is because you work in a social context. Your brain is evolved in a social context, and so this is a trick. Um, these social and self-esteem tricks are just ways to exploit that because they know that the standing of your reputation with others matters and so and so they kind of take advantage of this stuff okay um, another way in which um, you can have problems uh, or or how should I put it corporations or producers of products can kind of manipulate you into buying them has to do with this part whole relation so uh, I was buying Star Wars Rebels, uh, the most recent season, um, not too long ago, and the following message popped up. Okay, it said, um, you, basically, you have two options. You can buy this season in HD for $39.99. Notice the left-hand digit bias. Um, or you could buy this other one. It's standard definition, right? It's SD, and it's $34.99. Now, normally people would look at this and say, yeah, so I can either buy the HD version for 39 bucks or the SD for 34 bucks. It's only a $5 difference out of 40 bucks. I'm going to go ahead and pay for the HD version. Well, that's the wrong way to think about this, right? Um, what, what's actually happening here has to do with, oh, we've got a visitor. Okay. So what's actually happening here has to do with the part-whole relationship. And um, I hope I haven't covered this before, but um, the way that we see things is related to the way that we think about things. And so if you remember this example of this optical illusion, and I said, which circle is bigger? And it looks like the one over here is bigger because the parts around it are smaller, when in fact, these, the circle and this circle are the same size, right? Um, well, this something similar is actually going on with this with this example. Let me show you. Okay, um, whenever we're talking about making this purchase, as I just pointed out, people say, "Oh, you know, it's only a difference of five bucks or four bucks, and that's not much when you're dealing with forty bucks. It's like one tenth of the price, so I'm going to go for it anyway." Um, suppose that you're somewhere buying a suit, 
and the suit that you want to buy is $865. Now what I mean is you've got to buy a suit. It looks like this. It's a really good job. You have to have a suit that costs this much money. So suppose you say, okay, this is the suit. I want to buy the suit. Now, before you take it to the counter, you look on your phone and you find out that the same exact suit in your size is available from a store that's only five minutes away by car and the cost of that suit is 858 bucks. Now, would you take the trip, would you take the five minutes in the car to buy the other suit, right? The first suit is $865, the next suit is $858. Would you take that five minute trip to save the seven bucks? And most people say, no, I'm not gonna do that. That just seems silly because the cost of the suit is, you know, almost 900 bucks. I mean, we're talking about a thousand dollar suit here. What do I care about the seven buck difference, right? Okay, but now suppose you have, you wanna buy a pen and that pen costs $18. Now, you look, before you take it to the register, you look on your phone and you find the same pen that's only five minutes away by car and that only costs $11. Would you make that trip? Most people say, yes, I would make that trip, right? Because it's like, it's, it's almost half as much. It's like 50% off, right? But um, remember the dress? You, weren't gonna, you were not going to make the trip for $7 previously when the total was more, right? When you were dealing with like almost $900, it didn't seem like the trip was worth it. Well, what's happening? The difference is actually exactly the same. If you were, perfectly rational, then your answer to both the pen and the suit would be the same answer because um, the difference, the money saved is exactly the same amount, $7. Does that make sense? So a, a way to think about this is um, that we're not always perfectly rational, but we are to some degree predictably irrational, right? That, that advertisers and companies and people who sell stuff know about this and they're they're gonna they're gonna guess that in this situation you are highly likely to make a certain choice based on how your brain is operating that's why when amazon offers me the hd version for 40 and the sd for 35 they know i'm gonna pick this one because it's only a five dollar difference and i'm already spending like upwards of 35 dollars each but if you were rational if you were supremely rational the question wouldn't be well, there's only, a, I'm spending this much already, right? What is, what is the best thing to do, right? The best way to think about it is, do I want to save five bucks? If I want to save five bucks, then I'll get this one, right? The cheaper one, not how much am I already spending, right? Okay, um, so I hope that's helpful. It, it gives you some idea that many of these options are distractors to, to force you into buying a certain option anyway. Okay, um, the, and you've got one or two questions like that on the exam. Okay, the last component that we're going to talk about here with, with regard to advertising is um, Andre the Giant and, and an artist by the name of Shepard Fairey. Um, so, uh, many of you are familiar with this image, right, from Obey Clothing. Um, it comes from an artist named Shepard Fairey, um, who, and this is one of his original pieces, began posting these back east in different locations, I think in New York and New Jersey. Well, um, WWE found out about these posters everywhere, and WWE sent him a cease and desist, and I think they actually even filed suit against him um, in New York District Court, or might have been State Court. But the point is, WWE said, hey, we own the trademark Andre the Giant, and you are not allowed to go out and put it in your artwork because it doesn't belong to you. It's not your property, it's our property and we own it, right? So what Ferry does to avoid having to pay WWE and to get out of this hairy legal situation, he alters this original picture that he has here of Andre the Giant. He thins and, you know, um, he kind of stylizes it, right? Makes the lines very straight and clean and symmetrical. And then he adds this word, obey below it. Now he takes the word, and, and when he does this, before I get into this stuff over here, when he makes this change, the court then determines that there's enough of a difference between what he's doing now 
and WWE that that he's not liable anymore uh, for trademark infringement. Okay, so in other words, he he dilutes the resemblance of Andre the Giant here to the trademark Andre the Giant and just instead comes up with this picture which has now become so iconic in our society, right? Barry gets the idea to put the word obey um, at the bottom of the poster from a movie in the 80s called They Live with Rowdy Roddy Piper, which was a classic when I saw it as a kid. And you see posters like this in the movie. Essentially, you have to put on glasses and you can see the subliminal messages that they're sending to you. But, but the idea is people within the society are being told to just obey, do what the media tells you to do, so on and so forth. So... Um, now, you guys have seen Fairy's artwork all over the place. I want to talk now about um, uh, another artist who looked at Fairy's stuff, who looked at his work and was concerned. Now, this person's name is Mark Vallon. He's an artist in his own right, influential in the punk rock scene in Southern California and so forth. Um, and he publishes an article for Vanity Fair about Fairy. And one of the things that he says is what, what initially disturbed him about the art of Shepard Fairey is that it didn't display any of the line or the modeling, any of the other idiosyncrasies that, that you see in an artist's work. So uh, one way to think about this is um, sometimes you'll see famous pictures painted by a famous artist. And even though you, you haven't seen that picture before, you know just the way that it's painted that it's from this artist, right? So um, Winslow Homer paints a bunch of pictures of dogs, right? So boom, there's a picture of a dog. It's probably Winslow Homer. Boom, it was, right? Um, and Valen says, I don't see any of this. I don't see a coherent style in Fairy's work. And that just seems strange to me, right? Because it's something that, that you'd normally expect to see with a successful and mature artist. A vocabulary in a distinct way of, of drawing or painting or arranging, right? Um, and so Valen starts to look into it and what he finds is all over the place Fairy is using other people's images. So here you have a 1956 movie poster. It's, it's from a movie involving 1984 and then you see Fairy's use of the image right over here on the right. Um, now, what makes this tough is not so much that fairies using the image. We kind of live in an era where images get used and reused, right? I don't go, Professor Vid doesn't go and come up with new images for everything he needs to do. He does a Google search, right? But um, <clears throat> the difference here is that fairy doesn't ever attribute um, the original source, ever. And he treats all of this work as his own. So, um, over here on the left, you have a, um, a Vienna magazine, a Vienna magazine from 1901, and then on the right you have Fairy's unaccredited um, appropriation of that same image. This goes on for 17 slides, 16 slides. So here you have a Chinese, um, a, a, a propaganda poster from communist China. And then on the right, you see Fairy's taken the same image and he's now made rose, you know, out of this, calls it Guns and Roses. Now, again, I want to stress, what's important about this is that Fairy represents this image on the right as an original work, not a derivative one. Uh, same thing here again. You see um, uh, Rupert Garcia's um, civil rights action era art on the left, right? Down with the whiteness, okay? And Fairy takes this image and essentially slaps on Andre the Giant, puts power to the posse on it, right? Fairy never gives credit to Rupert Garcia when he does it. He just takes his work. Here's an Obey t-shirt. Took it from the Nazi Gestapo death head. No attribute, no attribution. Um, so here's a photograph of an anonymous Black Panther at a march. Um, boom, here's Fairy's street poster, which takes the image and doesn't supply any credit for it. Here is um, Vladimir Kozolinsky's Lino Cut on the left. This is a propaganda poster on the left. And Fairy's use of the image, just inverted right here on the right, does the same thing again. 
Dmitry Moore, Soviet Red Army poster, boom, used by Ferry. This goes on and on and on. So Ferry takes some Czechoslovakian street art made by an artist who is living under occupation, and Ferry takes it to, to make a poster with it. Um, same thing here, right? Uh, over and over and over again, right? Um, <clears throat> so this is a Liberate Puerto Rico poster, silk screen, right? From the Young Lords Party, political poster with political ambitions, and Ferry takes the image to sell posters with. Um, this is a, a silk screen by Rene Medeiros from Cuba, uh, one of the most cherished or a cherished artist in, in Cuba's history. And Ferry has taken the scene and used it to sell a T-shirt. So um, here's an example of a picture of, of Angela Davis um, by a Cuban artist, and then Ferry's appropriation of the image. Now, I seriously doubt that anybody who looked at this and knew who Angela Davis was would not know that this is Angela Davis. But the important point is that he's not citing the source, right? Which is important because you're saying that you've done the work. You're essentially lying, right? Uh, this goes on and on, right? You just flip through all of these. Now, fast forward to Mr. Orr in Texas. And Ferry has made uh, a, a tremendous career for himself with this image on the left. Sebastian Orr, who is an artist in Texas, takes this image on the left and manipulates it a little bit and he creates a Sarsgaard Andre the Giant. Uh, sometimes you see people, they're, they're in public, they're wearing a mask to, you know, lessen the risk of infection. Um, there was an epidemic at the time from an Asian flu known as SARS, and so people started wearing these SARS guards, and that's what this is, right? It's kind of a joke, right? It's like Andre the Giant wearing a SARS guard. He's concerned with infection, right? It's sort of silly. Well, you would think that when Orr does this, Ferry would, would think it's kind of funny, right? Like, in other words, Ferry should be okay with it because all that Orr has done is taken an original image and then modified it, right? Um, Ferry's not okay with Orr doing this. In fact, Ferry sends a cease and desist to Orr and threatens to sue him and ruin him if he keeps using this image. Um, so you have to remember, this is ironic, right? Because Ferry has made his entire career by appropriating or taking images from other people, and yet when somebody else does it, he threatens to sue. So he says here, um, I have principles and or doesn't, right? Uh, and a gross oversimplification of the situation would lead a lazy person to think that I'm a hypocrite for pursuing or. Um, but in basic terms, because we both used reappropriated imagery, the key difference in our motivations and my willingness to my the key differences in our motivations and my willingness to take responsibility for the things I do. Now, it's a fight between these two folks, whatever, right? So or buckles and says, fine, use your stupid thing, don't use your stupid thing, I don't care. Now, in the meantime, Ferry's career continues to take off. And Ferry is commissioned by uh, Barack Obama during his campaign to produce a, an election poster, which he does. You can see it here on the right, iconic poster. Some of you may even have it. Um, and, and, and Ferry great, makes this poster, everybody loves it, and, and okay, we're good to go. But there is a problem here. This image of Barack Obama was taken from this picture, this photograph taken by a photographer who happened to own the rights to that picture along with Associated Press. And so when this poster came out and Ferry got all this money and acclaim, the Associated Press said, hey, that's awesome, but you're using our property, so you better stop. And Ferry said, no, you're all wrong, you're lying, I didn't take your property, it was a totally different photo. Surprise, it was the same photo. He didn't take it from anyone, so he issued this statement. Um, and this statement is super long, right? But I'll, I'll kind of summarize it here. This is very on the right. <clears throat> in an effort to keep everyone up to date on my legal battle, I want to let you know about a development in the case. 
Throughout the case, there's a question as to which photo I used as a reference. Now that matters because the photos have different rights attached to them and different use permissions attached to them. Um, the, the Associated Press claimed that it was this one certain photo, the one I showed you, and Ferry claimed it was a different one, right? <clears throat> now, what they find out in the course of the lawsuit was that not only did Ferry use that original image that he, that he said he didn't, but he actually tried to change evidence and lie to the court about his use of that image. So um, he, he kind of writes a little letter here of apology. I'm very sorry to have hurt and disappointed colleagues, friends, family, da 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 right? So, okay, so he's caught, right? He's stealing other people's property and he's caught. Now this is ironic, right? Because he's also stopped other people, notably Orr, from doing the very thing that he has done. And he cited the difference between himself and Orr was that he had principles and Orr didn't. And yet those principles seem to be lacking here and this is, right, okay. Okay, so, so what does this matter, right? Does it matter at all? It matters, here's why, this is the point. What do you think of when you think of Obey Clothing? I normally think of somebody who's a little edgy, somebody who's a little cool, maybe on the inside, right? They're not buying the whole lies of the man kind of thing, right? That Obey is somehow counterculture. Um, look, it, the, the problem with this claim that, that Obey is somehow this counterculture is that it's not, right? When you buy a shirt, it's a shirt whether it has writing on it or not. And to think that you've bought this shirt and somehow now you're part of this counterculture is the wrong way to think about it. You are conforming to culture when you buy one of these shirts, right? You are doing exactly what the system wants you to do, right? The system wants you to buy stuff to be happy. And buy that stuff and pretend that that stuff is, uh, the properties of that stuff then transfers onto you, right? So I buy this cool Marvel shirt, so now I'm a cool, see, I'm the cool dad. I've got the Marvel shirt and I'm a dad, so I'm the cool dad, right? Not really, I could wear any shirt in the world that doesn't change who I am. So you have to be careful because in advertising, there's a great tendency to try and sell people on the idea that this object has these traits and if you buy this object, you will also have those traits. Look, you can have a supercharged car, Okay, and it can be the best, the best car in the world, but it doesn't mean you have a supercharged soul. It just means you have a nice car. So keep that in mind, right, when you're buying and when you're purchasing. The, the, the features of an object or something that you buy don't then necessarily transfer onto you. And yet, all too often in advertising, we think that they do. So keep that in mind, um, and I hope it's been very helpful.